Hi, I'm Peter Haddock and welcome to another edition of my new Think Tank series, supported by Leica Geosystems, the 3D machine control and surveying specialist. If you want to know how to get a connected worksite and all the benefits that can give you, visit leica-geosystems.co.uk. Folks, the Think Tank series is something I've been wanting to do for a long time, bringing all the content together that talks about how we can make that drop of diesel, whether it's red diesel, white diesel, HVO, or that bit of power in the battery, or even hydrogen in the future, make the most out of each drop that we can. The reason we need to do that is we need to be better guardians of the environment, and we need to do better for the next generation. But also, we need to profit from investment in new technologies and things. Why would you do something if you can't do it better, more productively, more efficiently? And one of my favourite guests, I've talked to him many times over the last year and a half, is James Cadman. And why is James Cadman one of my favourites, folks? He's the head of consultancy and carbon at Action Sustainability, but my listeners and viewers will know him for the Sustainability Supply Chain School and the all-impressive Plant Charter, which James has really spearheaded throughout the industry. James, welcome back. We've got a lot to talk about, haven't we? Yeah, thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be back. And why it's really exciting, James, is we've already done a podcast introducing the Sustainability Supply Chain School. We'll come on to more about it later. A while ago now, it's probably a year ago or so, mm. Lots and lots has changed, hasn't it, now, James? More demand from clients for support for their net zero clean air strategies. We've even had the introduction of Birmingham's clean air zone as well. What is going on out there? And it's getting much more real right now, isn't it, James? It is, definitely. You're right, Peter. There's, there's a lot going on. Everyone is waking up uh, to sustainability. Many people were awake already, but more people are getting awake to it. Maybe that's one of the silver linings to the whole COVID pandemic, that if we're going to be a profitable business, a profitable country, and we're going to be doing the right thing by the planet, we need to look at everything we're, 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 we're considering, everything we're touching. And plant and equipment is, is not excluded in that. Um, we see a lot of client organisations really ratcheting up their demands from their supply chain on cleaner equipment, lower emission equipment, just looking more and more into the future. It's partially about net zero on carbon. You know, we've got COP26 coming up in Glasgow, really driving the discussion. But also, as you rightly say, those kind of local authorities uh, city authorities looking at their air quality locally these two things go hand in hand and you know it is really a case of two birds and one stone you can look at what you're doing and you can think about global issues and you can think about local issues too and the great thing about that is that we're able to do this because we're able to share more online just like we're doing in this podcast and when you talk about james clients uh, organizations explain to me what they are really in layman's terms yeah to, to in, in the supply chain schools kind of language a client is it could be anyone everyone has a client and anyone could be a client but largely speaking it's those big organizations it's national highways recently changed from highways england of course it's the big water companies it's network rail it's hs2 it's all these big organizations but just as importantly their prime contractors below them are the major client for a whole bunch of other organizations yeah, so we've got the, the, that tiered structure that we have, main tier one contractor, tier two specialists, and even we have our plant contracting specialists. And we have the kind of mix in the UK, James, which is the plant hirers come contractors now as well. And that's really important, isn't it? Because you've got to get all of these people on board and everyone has a role to play. So tell me about what you think that the whole framework that we can bring and comes together is all about and how that works for the industry from the very top down and the very bottom up. Mm, it totally it's all about discussion and, and collaboration and I hesitate to use the word collaboration too much because it gets banded around all the time oh let's be more collaborative and definitely yeah but it could become cliched very quickly but it's definitely the right thing in the supply chain school particularly in the plant group we're all about collaboration let's have that discussion about what we can do together understanding that there are commercial tensions about you know addressing those sustainability issues that we're talking about and we we endeavor to uh, engage 
uh, stakeholders up and down the value chain from the OEMs who manufacture the kits, the plant hire companies that buy and hire it out, the contractors who either hire or buy in themselves and use it, and then the clients I just talked about. Everyone has a role to play, and we try and get people around the table to talk about what can we do jointly, what are we seeing coming in the future. You know, one of the things that uh, really stood out earlier this year was the uh, Construction Leadership Council's targets and ambitions for their Construct Zero Performance Framework. Bit of a mouthful, but it kind of does what it says on the tin. And they're talking about a commitment of reducing diesel plant on site by 78% within the next 13 years or so, by 2035. That's a big ask because there's a lot invested financially and emotionally in all the plant and equipment we have. Uh, And the last thing we want to see people do is just chucking out perfectly good equipment, but it's getting the right balance. How do we transition away from kind of more older equipment to something that's newer, cleaner, whether that's via HVO or electric or hydrogen, you know, there's a whole plethora of of power sources you know there's not one size fits all kind of thing but we've got some stringent targets Um, so we need to work together on what people want what organizations want and what can be provided as well yeah and I think what's important about that um, is I was on site with Lendlease recently who are a big contractor developer kind of a mix of a business they were delivering one of the huge redevelopments of Birmingham city centre the Perry Bar for the Commonwealth Games And one of the guys there, Paul King, who is the head of sustainability and social value, he's talking about their commitments. They have committed to net zero themselves. So fundamentally, they can't do it themselves. They can't do it on their own. But they've made that commitment to shareholders, to their clients, to the government that uh, obviously funds some of their projects as well. And so when you get big organizations that are enabling organizations, so they're enabling big developments to happen, and they're getting the funding and everything to make that happen, saying, we want to be net zero, and placing some of that burden on their supply chain, happen to be with Sunbelt Rentals on an innovation day, then that that becomes real, doesn't it? And so Mm. tell me a bit more about what this this more real sustainability actions that have have been taking place over this, this last year and as we come out into the new norm from the pandemic. Yeah, definitely. I mean, th- there's lots of phrases we could bandy around, but the one that comes to my mind, Peter, is, you know, no man is an island. No woman is an island. We can't do this on our own. There's a whole supply chain and value chain we've just been talking about, and no one single organisation has got it in their own power, as big as they might be, to actually solve this on their own. They need that collaboration and cooperation with with actors up and down the value chain. And we've mentioned all those who they are. And, you know, just to put throw some more stats on it, you know, a typical contractor might have somewhere you know in excess of 80 percent of their carbon impacts will be in their supply chain the materials the plant and equipment the services that they that they use it could you know some of them are as up as high as 99 percent you know wilmot dixon have got a very stringent target similar to lend lease on going net zero they know that most of their impacts in their supply chain and that includes the plant and equipment as well as all as you know the bricks and the blocks and the cement and the steel and so on so it's organizations understanding this getting a better grip on the data that's what's come out of more clearly over the last 12 18 months a better grip on the data what the position is and making some stringent commitments and targets of what we individually as organizations need to do to contribute to the net zero journey not forgetting the local air quality piece as well like i was saying earlier they go hand in hand let's you know let's solve two problems in one go so i think that what's changed over the last 18 months or so is that clarity of where we need to go everyone's been saying yeah we need to do it we need to do it great 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 but what do we do? How do we do it? By when? Put some numbers on it, put some milestones in, and then let's get going. Uh, we're not going to solve it overnight, definitely, but we uh, we can move very quickly. We've got a lot of the technology already. More technology will come along as well. So it, it's looking bright. Let's be positive about it. And I think one of the things that I am seeing is when I talk to people, when I talk to leaders, uh, and the recent podcasts I've done with Andy, the CEO of Sunbelt Rentals, for example, and with the team at Lynch Plant Hire, is actually data is now becoming a norm. So we have to provide the data. We ha- it has to be accurate. Clients are asking for things like as-built models of what's going on on site. They're asking for the as-built model, which is basically then given to them and the relationship with that to carbon. Mm-hmm. So they're saying how many um, diggers and ADTs and things like that have we had on site to deliver this proportion of the project and therefore what is the carbon that they have emitted and that's 
not an easy thing to measure unless you know what you're doing and unless you can engage with technology providers like sort of like a geo systems trimble etc topcon with a machine control so you can deliver those as built data inputs because you know the, the diggers are actually monitoring them as they go round but also you've got players like machine max for example that are coming mm -hmm. into the industry i know working with flannery i know they're working with plant force now to collect the data from the individual pieces of equipment and i know caterpillar uh, for example has a lot of that sort of data through its dealish network as well what do people need to understand with that james because fundamentally you know i'm going to lose out if i don't know how to do this sort of yeah. stuff to these bigger players but isn't that part of what the school's about and how you are educating and sharing that information because tell me you know I, I might be a tier two to the tier one con main earthworks contractors and i'm losing business because i don't understand this that's what the supply chain school's about isn't it yeah, exactly. The, the Supply Chain School, for those who don't know, it's a free resource online, lots of learning and content to improve your skills around fundamentally sustainability, but a whole bunch of other things as well, off-site, management, digital, so BIM, those kinds of things. Lots of lots of learning content on there. It, it's huge. You can't even begin to understand how much content is on there. You talk about some very good points there, Peter, about what's needed. Uh, I'll take you back five years. I did a piece of work supporting one of the contractors bidding into a major railway project project and they <laughs> oh, I wonder which one that one might be and it was one of the questions was well what's the carbon footprint or give us an idea of the carbon impact of what you might be constructing so I supported them developing a, a carbon footprint of a tunnel section uh, you know tunneling out and filling it in with concrete tunneling and you know all the rest of it that was a huge piece of work for a relatively small part of a tender question and back then it was quite rare that that a client organization would ask such a detailed specific question. It's becoming the norm now. It's getting more and more detailed in tender questions and, and, and winning work that there's something there about what's the carbon impact? What are you doing to reduce your carbon impact? And other sustainability stuff as well, social value, let's not forget all that and modern slavery, but particularly around carbon with the whole net zero and COP26 thing going on, more and more clients are saying, well, how are you gonna help us hit our targets? We've got a net zero target. What are you gonna to do to contribute? Planting equipment is not excluded again. It, it's a big part of the on-site um, uh, impact on what's consumed. So to, to deal with that, there's, there's, there's lots of skills that are required. There's not only the, the guys a bit like me who can do the number crunching on what the carbon impact is, but it's the people on the site who are going out and delivering it in real world. So the kind of stuff I did was all kind of modeled and on computers and whatnot. But if you're out on site, how are you going to actually deliver that against your contract? You've said you're going to reduce by 20% in your proposal show me and that's where all the telematics comes in that you talked about and the understanding of how they work and do they give you robust data and how do the operators of the kit know what to do so there's a whole bunch of skills in there digital skills that that organizations need to build in or buy in temporarily whichever uh, to understand how they can win the work in the first place but then deliver the school is part of that um part of that puzzle it gives you a lot of the information but then they're speaking with other colleagues there's getting other training that's 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 relevant so yeah there, there's there's a lot for people to do but it's it's the way the industry is going quite frankly yeah and i think you know you've touched upon the point where i want to talk about this thing about social value it's another buzzword but i'd like to explain it a bit more james about social value you know to me you know th this is becoming another big piece of the puzzle and we also talk about ESG, and you can explain that to me and the listeners as well, if you don't mind. But social value for me is the biggest challenge that we've got. We've got manufacturers like JCB uh, and others bringing out electric machines. We've got Caterpillar announcing its first all-electric mine in Canada with Nouveau Monde Graphite, which actually is a business that's mining graphite to go into the batteries that go into the machines that Perfect. create the circular economy to mine the, 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 the graphite that gets back in again. So the rare earth metals and all the, all the rest of it. And the, there's BHP, a massive, massive mining company that the Caterpillar are doing a similar thing to it. And there's the likes of Komatsu and Volvo that are also doing other pieces like that. But you know, the manufacturers are there, they're pushed anyway to be better and better by their own peers. But the the issue that we have, and we've seen it with HGV driver shortages, um, is we've got an operator shortage, not just an operator shortage in the fact of bodies in seats, but operator shortage in the fact of how we take 
the operator community to the next technology level. You know, we've got an aging population, and when I go on site, I always try and make time to talk to the operators. They, I call them the brains in the cab. And, you know, without them, your great big super duper semi automatic Zudar this with tilt rotator on telemetry, safety cameras, that is just useless without a good operator. And that is the social value element that we have got to concentrate on. It's upskilling, but it's bringing new people and new talent in. And it's actually screaming about the fact that if you become an operator now, there's been all sorts of rates banded around. I saw £28 an hour the other day banded around for an operator. You can make a really good living. You can be operating a piece of equipment, some of the larger stuff, worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. And you can create projects that are going to change lives forever. You know, how do we do that better, um, James? And, and what are you doing with people uh, in the school to just push that and support that? Social value, ESG, there are other buzzwords. Yeah, sadly, there's too many bits of jargon and acronyms going around. But yeah, it, j just on the ESG one, I'll cover that one off quickly. ESG stands for environmental social governance. It's another word for sustainability, really. But it's get organisations who look at, well, how do they operate their business to reduce their impacts and improve the lives of others with, you know, with whom they work. And that's where social value comes in. It's about how can we create additional benefit to the communities and neighbourhood that we work in, that we live in, through providing jobs, like you say. Um, apprenticeships, um, upskilling people, giving them new um, opportunities to work. And it ties into the, the recovery from COVID. It ties into how we're going to tackle climate change. And, and many of your listeners will be aware of a rather dry piece of kind of almost legislation coming from government called PPN 0620, this piece of procurement policy notice from June 2020, which says when uh, big public sector organisations want to procure, they have to include social value in their tender, which means that all the contractors who apply for that work and want to win it have to put in something in their response about how they're going to generate additional social value within that project that they're tendering for. And that can carry 10% or more of the weight of, of the bid you're going for. So it's it's chunky stuff. It's, it's you know, it's win or lose kind of level in terms of percentages. Um, and this will flow down the supply chain because if I was a tier one contractor bidding into uh, national highways and saying, oh, this is all the great social value stuff that I'm going to deliver on top of what would happen normally, I'm going to be looking at my tier twos and down to my suppliers and my plant hire companies and saying, how are you going to help me? It's the same way of thinking as carbon and climate change. It's just about social value. It's how do you develop communities? How do you bring that in? How do you get more people interested in the construction sector and from a diverse background it's not the usual white middle-aged bloke like you and me peter it's a, it's a diversity of pe diversity of people and different backgrounds and you know that can that can enrich a business so that there's there's a lot there to for us to get our heads around and yes the supply chain school can provide a lot of that learning and i say it's free come along join in on the webinars and the workshops that we have um it provides a lot of good information on you know what do you need to do it gets you up and running here's the basics here's some more detailed stuff it can get you to a place where you go i understand this topic now i'm confident to write that tender question or to have that conversation with my client um and you know ultimately become a, a more sustainable business out of the back of it yeah, and I think, you know, what this is why you're one of my favourite guests, James, and why, you know, I think myself and yourself are we're sitting slightly outside of the commercial environment of what people are working in. And we're providing the knowledge, hopefully from this podcast, but services like you do from Action Sustainability, but also pooling that information into a space like the sustainability supply chain school folks whilst i'm on it supplychainschool.co.uk and uh, that's where you get it all um but basically you know we need to make people more aware of these tools that are available because you know it can cost you a lot of money to get that level of advice when some of that starter advice is already there and then you can understand what you're looking for and who can help you and what can happen because you know what we don't want to do with all of this drive for, for sustainability social value value esg is make it a burden of cost for businesses particularly smaller contractors um, who are trying their very best to do the best thing that they can they haven't necessarily got as many resources in which to do that and that's really important. Um, and I think the other thing to understand, James, and you might be able to help me with this, is the commercial benefits of taking a more sustainable approach. You know, I saw 
uh, a big, big influencer the other day was literally talking about they're selling their plant and fleet uh, because their old HGV fleet is costing them a hundred pounds a day just to go out of the yard because they're in mm-hmm. the low emission zone. Yeah. So they looked at it and gone, that is costing me that amount of money each day. I can sell that on. Actually, they sold it through an auction, but I can sell that on. I can actually then use that money to finance a new truck fleet and the the economics work out and I save on diesel and my operators can have automatic machines rather than, uh, you know, manual. So they can deliver, not only just winning the work, but it can deliver a a commercial advantage, can't it? And what, what kind of things are you seeing with that area? Yeah, definitely. We're not just about hugging trees. I mean, that's kind of what we're getting at, but it is there has to be a commercial reality to this, definitely. You know, there's no point talking about sustainability if there are no businesses and organizations to deliver it. That is in itself not sustainable. The economics and the commercials, just as important as the, the environmental and the social bit. Um, we need profitable, successful, sustainable businesses, uh, clients, organizations, local authorities to be delivering on what we need as a planet fundamentally. So yeah, I totally agree. There's it, taking a sustainability approach approach prioritize to your organization your size your location you know the kind of sector you work in can really drive not just the winning the work as you said peter but also delivering efficiencies when you're delivering the work you know you're consuming less fuel you've got a happier workforce so you've got a lower turnover better retention of your workforce Um, all of this can contribute to being an even more sustainable business a more profitable business overall it can take time yes there are sometimes barriers it's undeniable that some organizations will try and charge a premium for the for the green option um but over time these things become the norm we've seen price drops in many sectors whether it's battery technology or solar panel technology as supply and demand goes up these things become more and more the norm and eventually as we've heard in the press about new build petrol and diesel engines being banned from the 2030s the lower end of the technology gets taken away from us we have no choice there was an article last week that finally there are no more leaded petrol sales anywhere on the planet algeria bizarrely was the last country who knew that still sold leaded petrol that's finally been got rid of so you know it takes time but these things wash through the system and one of the key things i wanted to kind of bring out from this is through the school and the plant group is that uh, you mentioned the commitment charter we have right at the beginning we've gained our 20th and 21st signatories over the last week or two uh, which is good Uh, we're making progress we're getting that message out of organizations wanting to do the right thing and demonstrate that they're doing the right thing Uh, so we're going to go out as a school um, in the next week or two with some bigger communications on that but it's getting more and more traction as people realize that you know it's business sense and it's the right it's the right message to our stakeholders our shareholders and so on So tell me then, what is the commitment those people have made, James? And uh, feel free to name them um, because uh, I can go on, whilst you're explaining that, I'll go on the website and I'll reel them all out in a moment. So tell me what is the commitment, James, of those people have made? Yep. So what we're getting them to do is there's something that your listeners might have heard me talk about before is something called the minimum standards. And that's getting organizations to say at the bare minimum, we're going to use plant and equipment that has such and such an emission level with the idea that we're pushing the market from the bottom upwards towards better, cleaner equipment. We're not stipulating whether that's electric or hydrogen or HVO or whatever, but, you know, whatever's suitable for the application at the time. But the message is let's drive towards a cleaner piece of equipment both for carbon uh, globally and local air quality but we also get them to commit to engaging with their supply chain with their manufacturers with their clients about this about upskilling their workforce about measuring what they're actually doing and, and looking towards innovative ideas as well so kind of going above and beyond what you might normally do and as I say we've got we've got we've got 19 currently I've just had a message from the 20th and 21st that we're going to join up but there's there's a broad bunch in there there's the plant hire companies as you as you might expect there's the tier one contractors there's a couple of what I've been calling clients uh, you mentioned machine max as well they're kind of slightly to one side of that but they're with definitely within that that bubble yeah so flannery lynch sunbelt speedy there's lots in there costain kia people are coming on board morgan sindel as the names come to my mind yeah it's all good exactly and you know i'll chuck a few more in there murphy plant sunbelt rentals thomas plant hire select m o'brien jay coffrey uh, plant division gap group explore environment agency amory construction Arden Hire Solutions, to name a few more, James. But, you know, these are signatories. These are big, big businesses that have gone, hey, we're in this. 
and uh, we're going to make a commitment but that commitment is actually to do something so that's the you know it's not about oh look i'm going to sign this piece of paper so that actually i can get on a tender list that is not what it's about this is about actually saying i'm going to reach these minimum standards and i'm going to actually preach the sustainability and the values that the plant charter is out there because it's it's about that as well isn't it james Exactly. It's it's about that communication as well. So it's it, on the one level, it's what are we doing as an organisation? And on the bigger picture, it's about how are we engaging with our suppliers, our operatives, um, our clients, you know, let, let's let's manage upwards as well as manage downwards in, in that contractual relationship. We Let's say, look, this is what we should be doing. We should be moving to stage five or beyond as soon as possible. And where possible, we should be doing that. We are aware of the fact, of course, that there are smaller contractors out there that might not have the, the budget and the wherewithal to go out and buy the latest fanciest this that and the other that's why we talk about minimum standards rather than you know everyone should be at this kind of really high level that's not realistic if people want to get there and can great go for it but we want to get everyone along the journey that the school is by its very nature an inclusive initiative everyone's welcome basically be it a small organization or a large one yeah and that's why i think it's it is about growing and it's about making stuff available that's free that is then you know, funded by those people that are supporters of the school. And those are the big players. So actually what we are getting there, you know, is these individuals, these big businesses have committed to support the Supply Chain Sustainability School with the content so that other people can take advantage of that. Because, yes, they are in a privileged position, and that's great. Now, James, before I let you go anywhere, um, I've got another little topic area that I need to talk mm -hmm. about. We've seen over the last, since the pandemic started, we've seen people launching more and more electric machines. We've even seen JCB announce that it's got a hydrogen backhoe loader. And yesterday, JCB Joe Bamford, who's one of the heirs of the JCB business, has announced a hydrogen investment fund, which they hope to get it to a billion pounds. Well, basically, hydrogen is in a talking point proposition right now, James. It's part of the story of the future and where we're going to get to in that space. And I think, you know, when you see announcements that wind farms are going to have platforms that are going to pump electricity straight into hydrogen generation, which is then going to be pumped from the sea into hydrogen stations, filling stations, let's say, in the same way that oil is being pumped and has been for many years, then we're getting towards a different scenario. We all know the infrastructure has to be there for hydrogen. We haven't worked that out yet. But it's not going to be that far away when all of this technology and investment, billions and billions of pounds, is going into that fuel source. What are your thoughts about that? I think hydrogen has to be part of the picture. Uh, speaking with many of the stakeholders I engage with, there is no one single solution. I think I mentioned this earlier. There's there's going to be a blend of, you know, the smaller end, the, the lighter end of plant and equipment, you know, electric works really well. It's nimble. It, it, it charges up. And as long as you can get a full shift out of it, then great. Uh, obviously, as you get to the heavier end, it gets literally a lot heavier with a massive battery in it. But of course, it takes longer to charge up and you might not get a full shift. And clearly, there's a big expense as well, let alone the issue about are there enough rare earth metals? on the planet to, to provide all the batteries we need. Hydrogen seems a great solution. It's not new technology. The concept of fuel cells has been around for years. The chemistry behind it is has been known for decades. It's the infrastructure, as you say, Peter, and I think that's what we, what we really need. I have a lot of optimism about that. We have the infrastructure already with a gas network for natural gas, and likewise, as you mentioned, with four quarts for diesel and petrol. It's adapting those. It's changing those. We don't need to start from scratch. We can build that up relatively quickly. We can ramp it up. As long as we go with the, the green hydrogen that you're alluding to, where we use you know, wind turbine and renewable power to create the hydrogen rather than what's sometimes termed blue hydrogen, where you take uh, fossil fuels, create the hydrogen. I mean, that can be a stepping stone along the way. Yeah, but as long as we get to green hydrogen as soon as we can with all the infrastructure, then definitely it has to be part of the mix. We're going to still need big ADTs. We're going to still need you know massive 30 turn excavators. And yes, you can put batteries in them to some extent, but I think hydrogen has to be the way forward. Um, and, and there's no reason why we can't do that. You know, we, we have the, the wherewithal you know engineering and technology it's got to be part of the future and you know we're surrounded by oceans you know we, we've got a limitless supply of fuel we've got that and we've got the sun and we've got the wind what, what else you need a pipe that's it <laughs> absolutely just a pipe yeah slightly I'm... simplified it but <laughs> uh, no but it's true but it's true and you know 
And we all know, James, and I, I think this is the last part of the conversation today, we all know that the biggest threat to the industry right now is not the plant shortage, is not the people shortage. That will get sorted out over time. It is the shift from red to white diesel and HVO, which is literally around the corner. People have been putting it off. People have been putting it to the side saying it's never going to happen. The government is not saying anything I've heard that says scrap the move from red diesel to white diesel. There is a huge cost implication for people and projects and everything like that. We're talking about the rise in inflation of materials at the moment because of shortages, because of factory closures, because of the situation we've been in. What do people need to do, James, to make sure they're not caught out in a horrible way with this transition and where can they find information about that and this really james comes to the fact of my think tank series mm. to make more out of the drop that's in the tank because that drop's going to be more expensive yeah yeah i i hear what you're saying peter and i think you know april 2022 it's going to happen there's been i mean i think some people have been trying to put around rumors that it will, will get scrapped on maybe the hope that it will get scrapped but i can't see i've seen nothing concrete that comes out of it that says it's going to be delayed for another year because it was meant to happen was it this year or 2020 but obviously covid got in the way um so it was delayed but ultimately it's coming you know there's going to be an extra 40p or so uh, in terms of levy tax levy and that applies across diesel and hvo there's no kind of exemption for hvo there's red diesel red hvo and there's white diesel and white hvo it's you know they they are not distinguished in that respect so it is coming so i think organizations gearing up as soon as they can to understand what the implications are there's going to be an additional cost and speaking with their supply chain speaking with their clients speaking with their suppliers what does this actually mean because they they need to have continuity of delivery on site they, and for that to happen they need to have continuity of delivery of fuel and the the, the cost that goes with that so there's going to be some commercial negotiation clearly um, that goes hand in hand with it but also it's an opportunity to say well if we're getting another 40p of cost even if we try and hand it on to someone else you know down the supply chain it's going to come onto our books how can we be more efficient how can we use the equipment and the people to be even more efficient with the fuel that we do consume and that's the kind of the mantra of the supply chain school as well you know it's it, you've got that great equipment as you were mentioning earlier peter but it's the operative inside the cab or you know driving it remotely however they're doing it who can actually say how can i be more uh, frugal with my fuel you know not leaving it idling not using it in the wrong mode um making sure the aircon isn't blasting out really cold on a day like today when it's 28 degrees outside you know it's it's that kind of mentality as well as the commercial bit and understanding the supply and demand of of the fuel whether you switch to HVO or not, or something uh, different, is another story. But the, the whole tax rebate thing, it's there, and people need to start thinking about doing something now, because it's only six months away. Yeah, absolutely. And when you bring that extra cost into your finance of a project, say that you are uh, giving customers a fixed rate moving per cube, yeah. for example, then yeah. you know, you've know you got to factor all that in. And if you bring in technology, if you bring in other solutions, and if you bring in a connected work site, which is another one of my favorite topics, where you can see all the equipment, you can see all the people, you can see all the things that are happening. Here's a traffic jam that we've got. Let's stop and let's uh, let's make sure we manage this site a bit better or do things to haul roads to maintain the, the equipment flow better, for example. It's all about the setup, using 3D solutions, drones, yeah. everything that we can pull together to analyze the whole site to connect every device and every every person on it so that we aren't getting people going in the cars even to come to site to change things and to look at things because we've got that information in front of us it's going to drive the connected work site james isn't it i've, I've seen some really good examples from some of the oems i've been speaking with about smart data and smart energy handling and it's, you know these exist in buildings in building management systems already but but just having that technology on site as well so you can manage the energy flows um particularly as you you ramp up having more electrical equipment so it's not just your site welfare cabins and your generators but all the other equipment you know your little excavators and other things that you know move around on site if they're pulling an electric charge from the grid it's managing those peaks and troughs 
just a bit of clever kit, really. If you've got a site that's going to be there for a decent amount of time, it's worthwhile investing in that. You'll manage your energy loads, you'll manage your noise, which is relevant, of course, for your local neighbours or your social value again. Um, but also directly your, your operational cost. You know, if you're going to use less energy, it's going to cost you less. It's, it's quite a simple formula. So, you know, thinking about some of those kinds of things as well as we transition to a lower carbon economy. And some of that is being pushed by the tax rebate. Definitely. That's one of the reasons behind it, as well as HMRC wanting to get more money off us. There's definitely a bit about, you know, can we push towards a lower carbon? But then there's got to be a pull as well. There's got to be, you know, the client saying this is what we want and the, and the stakeholder saying what, this is what we want. So it's kind of, you know, almost a perfect setup to say it's time to think about this and start investing. And that super deduction is absolutely coming at the right time as we're going to have this diesel problem uh, next year. Of course, one of the things that you guys do do, James, is regular webinars and things like that, as well as the content that already exists on the website. Uh, something's coming up in the future. Tell me about it. Yeah, we've got what we call a lunch and learn. It's a one hour webinar, effectively, that the school runs on the 9th of November. So it's during the week of COP26. Uh, and we're getting a couple of great speakers on to talk about HVO. There's a lot more interest in hydro treated vegetable oil, HVO. Is it the right thing to do? Should we be using that instead of, of conventional diesel? So we're getting two experts from the sector on, we're getting Mike Derome from Speedy Hire and Mark Clouter from WP Group to come along to a session online, free to attend, like all school events. And they're going to talk about the ins and outs of HVO, how does it compare to diesel, what are the supply chain issues, and so on. And, and the school will be moderating and facilitating and, and taking your questions. So do come along. That's great. Uh, I will certainly try and make that one, James, because great speakers, like you say, and it's bite size, which is what I like. Where can people register for that? Again, is it is it going to be promoted on supplychainschool.co.uk? It is, yes, that's correct. So if they go to supplychainschool.co.uk and you click on the events button, which should be prominent somewhere on the top of the screen, you'll then see a list of events coming up. If you just search for HVO and the 9th of November, you'll find the event and then you register. You do need to be a member of the supply chain school to register. And that again is free. Uh, so if you're already a member, great, you just register, job done. If you're not a member, you go through a very simple uh, registration process uh, like you would on, on many websites to set up an account. Uh, but I stress again, it's free. So do jump on. Certainly will be. That's a great webinar and there's lots more things. When you do register, folks, you do get alerted to all of these things that are coming up. And let's remember, they can save you an awful lot of money, time and effort by listening to the people that are already doing that stuff. And it's free. So why why wouldn't you? And of course, you can catch up on those sort of things on the website afterwards if you can't make it on the day. James, it's been another massive podcast and I've overrun yet again. Uh, we're going to have to leave James, folks, because he's got the day job to do. Oh, wow, he's got a lot of work on his hands. But James, it's great to hear from you again. We're going to be hearing more from James and myself as we team up uh, throughout this year and next uh, to bring you more information from live sites as well and events not just on the digital podcast that we've done today and uh, what a great opportunity to again strengthen my think tank series which floods right into the, the sustainability supply chain school it's literally bolted right in there and i think you know for me if i can drive more people to educate themselves for free to the Sustainability Supply Chain School, supplychainschool.co.uk. Thanks to James. Wow, that will be a major achievement for me. James, it's been a pleasure. Once again, thanks for your time. Thanks, Peter. Great speaking with you. Ta-da. Right, well then, folks. Whoa, I love talking to James. He's exciting. He can tell me things that I don't even know about, which is super cool. And for me, that is one of the critical points of how we deliver a much more carbon and sustainable environment, all the little catchphrases that we've talked about there. But it's about people, folks. All of the things we do is all about people. It's about making those decisions, finding out the information that you can do. And again, supplychainschool.co.uk. Oh, I love the new Think Tank series. We can talk about it. Every drop matters and every bit of your time has mattered to me today thanks very much for listening and thank you to my super duper sponsor Leica geosystems the 3d machine control and surveying specialist and of course they're helping people get to the connected work site of the future where we're getting safer and we're getting more efficient and the productivity is going through the roof so basically if you want to find out how to get a connected work site with Leica Geosystems, visit leica-geosystems.com.
www.cbsradio.co.uk. Thanks again, folks, for listening. Stay safe, look after yourself, and until the next time, goodbye. <laughs>